Mark, thank you for making the time and coming on the podcast. I'm delighted to be here. You've got this great new book out. It's called Belonging to the Brand, Why Community is the Last Great Marketing Strategy. Uh, I've, I've read most of your books. This is, this is I think, is your best one yet. Oh, um, thank you. I actually think it's it's one of those books that every fundraiser should be buying in 2023. And I want to get into it. So today we're going to get into why why community is is a great marketing strategy. Why now? Like what's what the shift in society has been? Why that matters to every single nonprofit listening to this? How to actually do community well because there's ways of doing it well and there's ways of doing it not well. And also a little bit the the business case behind it because there is a business case behind it as well. And so I felt super validated reading your book because nonprofits have this built in, not, not everyone, but a lot of nonprofits have this built in community advantage. Mm -hmm. And here's people like you saying, Hey, we need community. This is important. If you want to win in marketing, so to speak, you need community. Can you get into the insight behind that? Like, why did you choose yeah. to write a book on community? Yeah. So um, yeah, first of all, it's an excellent question, and I'm glad you found it a validating book. It it really should be a validating book because I think the the nonprofits, the, the sector you describe, are really poised to win in our world right now. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is actually set up the business case for this idea using a story from a previous book, Marketing Rebellion, because the thesis behind this idea that community is the last great marketing strategy is based on a couple big mega trends. And the first one is marketing and advertising don't work like it used to. So that's, you know, whenever your audience is thinking, oh my gosh, if we just had more money, that's not necessarily going to solve the problem. So let me tell you this story. So I had been reading how many iconic brands built on advertising, like Ivory Soap, were in tremendous decline. Ivory Soap in the 1960s had 50% market share. Today, it has less than 3%. It Intuitively, it doesn't make sense. Soap isn't being disrupted. We right. still use soap. Um, Procter & Gamble owns Ivory. It's the most famous soap brand in the world. How could they blow it so badly? Well, one night I was having dinner at a friend's house. I would just been reading about this news in the Wall Street Journal about how these brands built on advertising were in decline. Went into the restroom and I saw this handmade artisanal soap from the Knoxville Soap Company, where I live. The lady who was cooking me dinner that night, I came out and I said, I have a question. Can you join me in the bathroom for a minute? She got a strange look on her face, but <laughs> she obliged me. I said, Procter & Gamble has been advertising to you your whole life. Why do you love this brand? She said, you know, I don't know if I love this brand, but I love the hands that made it. She went on to tell me about how she loves this family business in her community, how they're involved in the community. They teach classes on entrepreneurship. They teach their, they, they treat their employees so well. They're creating a sustainable business. They're using local ingredients. She was so enthusiastic about this brand and this company, she made me go out and get the soap, which I did. Now, the interest, and, and she went on to say, you know, you mentioned advertising. She said, I can't remember the last time I saw an ad. I watch TV all the time, but it's on Netflix or Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. I listen to music all day long. It's on Spotify. Mm -hmm. I never hear an ad. Or maybe I'll listen to an audio book. Undoubtedly, one of mine. Who? What else would, would she be listening to? But she never hears an ad. So for many people today, especially young people today, their advertising consumption has declined by 95% in the last five years. 
So just thinking, oh, if we had more money for advertising, that doesn't really mean anything. So what's suggested, what's suggested here, Mike, is that the customer is the marketer. Marketing today means creating so something so interesting, so valuable, so unmissable that it ignites conversations in the community. People aren't going to see your ads. If they see them, they're not going to believe them. But they, we do believe each other. Now, let's talk about community. Why is community so important? So most businesses and nonprofits today, they're working with social media. Maybe they're even creating content like a blog or a podcast or some sort of, you know, maybe videos to show behind the scenes of what they're doing. All that is great. And what we're trying to do is establish this emotional connection between what we do and our audience. The, but what, what I'm suggesting is you're stopping short of the, the finish line. The ultimate emotional connection is in community. Mm -hmm. If you go away, the blog goes away, the podcast goes away. But a community is where the real emotional connection is taking place. There's a case study in my book about Alice, Alice uh, Ferris. She has a business that helps nonprofits with fundraising. Yeah, and she amazing. is really- yeah, Alice, Alice is amazing. Yeah, you know, Alice, yeah. yeah she's yeah. become a friend and I admire her very much. Alice, um, what a visionary. And she sort of learned by tri and trial by fire over the years that community is really the- the, the future. It has to be. And the other mega trend that's going on, again, that I think everybody can see this out there, is that we've got this mental health crisis sweeping the world. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's in the news every day. M more people are disconnected, isolated, lonely, depressed, or worse. It's a, it's a global health crisis. We long to belong. Many of our societal institutions that we that used to create belonging, like you know, community clubs, social clubs, churches, even youth sports took mm -hmm. a hit during the pandemic. Yep. You couldn't play outside. The kids turned to video games and never turned back, right? So these institutions are crumbling. And I say in the book that look, we've got an opportunity to get on the front lines of a new way of thinking about marketing and create something that actually does something good for the world. Mm -hmm. I'm not being Pollyannish saying, hey, everybody start a community and change the world. This is a business book with a very strong business case behind it about why marketing should be looked at as a brand marketing strategy but it also does good for our community. Right. All right. So, so advertising marketing, not working as well as it used to big mental health crisis. We've got uh, during COVID, we saw two generations actually be very much affected by this. One was the older generation, people in care who weren't getting visits from children, who weren't getting visits from family, who were dying of loneliness. The New York Times report on that. You point out that the New York Times also reported on Gen Z being the loneliest generation ever. Yeah. They are... Uh, if that doesn't break your heart, I don't know what will. I mean, our, our children, our teenagers, are, are they're, they're suffering. After I wrote the book, there was a research report that came out that said 51% of young adults aged 18 to 24 have sought medical attention for a mental health problem, 51%. The average for every other generation, including millennials, is 24%, including me. I have gray hair. I've had a long time to seek mental health support. <laughs> yeah. 24%, 51% for 18 to 24. It ought to really create a sense of urgency in all of us to do what we can to, you know, to, reach out to these kids. Right. So then let's get into the, um, uh, that's a great setup for here's, here's why we need community. 
let's get into the mindset shift that you talked a little bit about because it is a different way of thinking some leaders will will see building a community as giving up control and it's the old way of controlling the narrative controlling the message um whoever tells the best story wins and we control the story that's sort of a mindset and some leaders will be afraid hey if we built this whole community thing how can we still maintain our our influence how can we still maintain control of the narrative of the message that's that that's a very harsh way of phrasing it but <laughs> but when when you are building a community you're relinquishing all of that well kind of kind of i mean the the power of community and the benefit of the community is that it keeps you relevant. It keeps you <clears throat> connected. It helps drive you in ways to make you relevant in your city, in your state, wherever you operate. <clears throat> Let me give you a small example from my own experience about why this requires a different mindset and why this is actually super powerful and incredibly interesting. So I created a community dedicated to learning about the future of marketing. So this was a space, anybody could come in, we could talk about what's going on, what are we learning, what are we seeing? So when I started this community, I thought, well, people are gonna be interested in the things I'm interested in. Mm. So I created a little space about writing and public speaking and personal branding. And now we've been in it maybe a year and a half. And those are the quietest rooms in the whole space <laughs> because the community came in and said, let's talk about the metaverse. Let's do experiments in the metaverse. Let's talk about NFTs and Web3 and artificial intelligence. And this community is so vibrant and taking me in so many new directions. Mm -hmm. Every blog post I write, every class I teach, every speech I give now is based on something I'm learning in that community. I'm, be, I'm in touch with things that people are seeing all over the world. So, and we've become friends, right? In a community, you create, when you, when you create these bonds, that's the difference between an audience where people don't know each other and a community where people know each other. Right. When you create those friendships, you create an, a, a, an emotional layer of switching costs. So there's a lot of competition out there right now, right? So let's say you're a you're you're a zoo, you're a nonprofit that's a zoo, and you create a community, and it, you you've got volunteers and everybody in there that loves animals, and you've got the volunteers posting pictures and progress and behind the scenes, and boy, anybody in this community that loves animals is going to want to be part of this thing. Now people start to know each other, they start helping each other. They meet each other face-to-face -face at zoo events. Now, when someone else comes knocking on the door saying, hey, we want you to give your time, your resources, your treasure to this, you know, some other charity, I say, I'm already committed here. Mm -hmm. I can't leave this place because if I leave this place, I leave my friends. Right. So that's what marketing is all about, creating... Yeah. Yeah an emotional connection between what you do and your customers or your volunteers or your, your donors. And this is the ultimate way to do that. Right. And it right. doesn't, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Right. It's not easy. It takes work, but no marketing is easy today. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And most of the work is what, what Seth Godin calls emotional labor, right? It is, mm -hmm. it is just showing up and, and doing that kind of work. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I'm curious to get your take on this. We often talk about winning, and I'm I'm using air quotes here. In community, you know you're winning when members of the community are actually communing with each other. And, yeah. And like like the relationship isn't just like a vertical to you. It's it's right. horizontal across members. Yes, and exactly. They're associating you with the community, but it's not even, you know, if you weren't there, 
they might still show up and have the party. They will. They will. I mean, that's when you know it's working. And here is one of the profound things I learned. I mean, look, I went down deep, deep rabbit holes, you know, of psychology and sociology and organizational development researching this book. And one of the things I found is that this relationship between the members, that's what really keeps the community going. And that goodwill and that emotion transfers to the nonprofit. It suggests a strategy where it's almost more important. Well, I think it is more important Mm -hmm. to create those collaborations and friendships between the members than between you, than between the brand or the organization and the members. Yeah, That's what keeps them coming back. That's what creates enthusiasm for the, for the community. Yeah. Let's talk about the responsibility of the leader of the community. So, so you as the organization, as a nonprofit who who decide you're going to lean into this community thing, you're going to try to create something. Our point of view is that fundraisers have a duty of care for the emotional well-being of their donors. And I don't mean that in a way that that is unhealthy um, mm-hmm. and that we become overly personally sort of yeah. responsible for people. That's not what I mean. But I mean, yeah. is if somebody is if somebody is giving to your organization, they're doing so because they clearly care about the same things you care about. There's a values alignment. Yeah. They're, they're trying to become a better person through their giving, a better version of themselves. Yeah. They're stepping into some sort of identity that mm-hmm. that says i'm like you you're like me we're kind of like different from other people together right mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. if if people give you the gift of their attention and money and you know are showing up with their values that align with yours you've got this duty of care but yeah. how in in a community how do you see that playing out like what is the responsibility of the organization that is going to start this community yeah so great question and let's unpack that a little bit because I love what you're saying here about where the donors or the you know the stakeholders have this unified belief and purpose and vision with the with the nonprofit. Now look, that's where most for-profit organizations fall off the wagon. That's why their communities fail because most companies want to create a community to make money to sell stuff. And that's why the community fails. So I think that's another reason why I think nonprofits are built to win in this environment, because almost de facto, you're you, you, there's a purpose that unites you. It's not just about the money and the resources. It's about, I believe in this. The organization believes in it. We believe in it. That is a great starting point for a community that companies don't have that advantage. That's number one. Number two, you talk about this emotional safety. All right, that is really the number one leadership skill needed in community. It's not about control. It's not about, you know, creating a a staff of people, creating an infrastructure. It's about the culture about creating a culture of safety, responsibility, nurturing people, rewarding people, acknowledging people. You you use the term showing up with the emotional labor. That's entirely what's going on in, in, in a community. So again, I think everything about the culture of nonprofits, the mindset of nonprofits, the leadership who is already willing to invest the emotional labor. I mean, everything just really nonprofits have such an advantage here that I, that I think they ought that it, once, once they read the book, there's going to be this big light bulb, I think, and say, look, we're 90% there. Mm-hmm. I, I really believe that it's, it's just looking at community in a, in a whole different way. Right. You know, when, when COVID first started, uh, I, st- I started getting all these emails of companies. I didn't even know I was on their email list, but like I had bought socks like five years ago. Right. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, we care about your safety. Like you're part of yeah. the sock community. Yeah, and right. It, it just rang so <laughs> hollow, right? Like oh, sock community. I'm not part of like I, I bought socks 
you know, off of some random D 2 C online brand that I that yeah. you know, like so it seems like the word community it's not new. Certainly everybody says we've got a community. Very few actually do. What yes. the def what defines what separates a hollow sort of, you know, we've got a customer community from a great one? Well, most people who say we've got a customer community don't have a community at all. They have a list of customers. That's not a community. Or maybe they have people who follow their blog. Mm -hmm. That's an audience. That's not a community. And an audience is fine, by the way. I mean, I have an audience. I have a blog. I have a podcast. You know, you're kind enough to reflect on you've read a number of my books. So you and I probably connected at one point on social media. You became aware of me. Yeah. So that's cool. Then you became part of my audience. Maybe you read my blog, you read my books, but you and I didn't really connect on an emotional level. But in a community, what if you were part of my community? We would become friends. We'd start to collaborate. We'd co-create. We'd do things together. The sky is the limit. So the three defining factors of a community versus an audience is number one, in a community, there's communion. People commune together. They, they know each other. So that's sort of a signal. If the people you're talking about, if you're defining as community, if they don't know each other, it's not a community. Right. It's something else. It's a list or an audience. Number two, and this is what we just talked about, which is the beauty, really, I think, and the opportunity of nonprofits, is this unifying purpose. And so it's got to be something in your DNA. Why do you exist? And how could we exist in a better, bolder, more impactful way if we bring people along with us in community? That's harder for a company to do than a nonprofit. So like I said, I'm not, you know, I said, nonprofit, you've already got 90% of the work done. <laughs> then the third idea is that it's adaptable, that it changes with the times. And that's really important because this is all about connection and relevance. And the world is changing and needs are changing, priorities are changing. And so the community is almost like you know, a living organism. The role of the nonprofit is to define the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Here's the boundaries. You know, we're you know, we're all about, let's go back to the zoo example. Um, you know, we're all about, you know, responsible care for for animals and education and civic responsibility and volunteerism. We're not going to start a discussion group on knitting. We're just, we're just what I, you know, look, we love that topic. Go start your own group. Mm -hmm. We encourage you. This is awesome. Go start your own community. So, you know, here are the riverbanks, but within the riverbanks, the flow is changing and surging and, and moving in different directions. And that's wonderful. That's beautiful. That helps keep you relevant. You're going to find information from your community that's going to allow you to adjust to new economic realities, new civil realities, new civic realities faster mm -hmm. than anybody else. And that's going to be a, an amazing uh, yeah. competitive advantage. You've talked about the community you created and you have different rooms online. Uh, in the zoo example now, we talked about starting a, a room for knitting. So we've largely talked online sort of communities. Yeah. Is there a difference between like online and in-person should be a hybrid of both? Like what have you in your research yeah. seen that how do those delineate? And maybe they don't, maybe it's one and the same. Well, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I was in remiss in really focusing mostly on online communities and it certainly can be both. And what I found is that every successful online community has an offline component and every offline community has an online component. So in a community, let's say 
it's a community that gathers, you know, in a church room mm. once a month to learn something, study something, or some, you know, community organization. Well, in between that meeting, you want things to be updated. You want conversations to continue. So maybe you need a Facebook group or a Slack channel or something like that. If you're an online group, that's fine. But the emotional connection is really reinforced and taken to a new level when you meet people face to face. I believe the biggest community I profile in this book, and there are examples for everybody. There's business, but there's also nonprofit. There's big businesses and there's small businesses. The smallest community profiled in the book, I think, is 30 people. There's even uh, a very successful community profiled in this book. It's one a stay-at-home mom raising five kids, and she's got a community with 50,000 people in it, right? So, I mean, this is kind of accessible to anyone. The barrier to entry is very, very low, almost almost nothing other than your your time and patience. So every community has has an offline component. The biggest community I think profiled in the book is Twitch, which has you know millions and millions of people, but they have an annual conference. Mm -hmm. You know they have an annual conference to bring everybody together and to just reinforce those friendships, and that makes the community more popular and stronger. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I just feel so strongly that people need to gather. There, there's got to be some sort of, I think the online experience can totally be human. And I'm I'm part of some wonderful online communities. But even as a company, we're, we're a remote company, and we have to gather at least once a year, it makes all the difference. It would be a completely different ballgame if we yeah. didn't. Uh, you know, a few months ago, we were doing uh, uh, some strategic planning with a small organization. And it was a strategy sprint. And as part of the first day, um, they had to come up with a sentence, short, snappy, to the point, and it had to reveal a core truth about who they wanted to be. And the sentence was, we will win by. And then, you know, they all they did this exercise and they came back with, we will win by building deep community with our donors. And then we spent the next sort of few days trying to <laughs> decipher what that means and, and how they're going to go about doing that. So I'm curious from you, we, we've we've gone through the business case, we've gone through what defines a community, the, the three traits that define a community. I'm curious from you to hear, let's say we're going to do this community thing, we're all in, we're, we're bought in, Mark, this is awesome, we're doing it, we're, we're putting resources toward it, we're going to do whatever it takes. What does a, um, what does a community that that is successful in in and not in numbers, just successful as operating as a community. What are some what are some of the defining sort of traits that you see of a community that works versus most communities out there who are like ghost towns? Well, I think a key reality is that a community is competing for attention. Mm -hmm. with everything else it's competing with baby pictures on facebook it's competing with words with friends it's competing with the mandalorian it's competing with all other ways you can be spending your time so i think it's important in the community to create conversations, and even better activities to keep people involved, to keep them interested. In my community, I mean, my community is at a point right now where it's almost like on autopilot, mm -hmm. where engaged, passionate marketers in my community have taken the ball. And, and it was, it was really, uh, it was really funny, Mike, that for me as a leader, this was a little disorienting and unnerving at first, where someone would come up with an idea. You know, it's like, well, this is my community. You know, what do I what do I do this? And I would say, Oh, that's a great idea. Why don't you do it? And they said, Okay. And every time they've said, Okay. 
And they love that recognition and they love the opportunity to create their own kind of thing. So now we're having like parties in the metaverse <laughs> <laughs> that are totally run. Sometimes I'm not even there. Yeah. And, you know, people are learning and we're experimenting and, and it's fun. And it's, it's, it's an activity that, that people can do. You know, another thing I'm doing is like, when there's something like big in the news that involves impacts business and marketing, I'll think who would be a good person to talk about this with? Let's just have a zoom call about it and invite the whole community. Gotcha. And we could say, Hey, look, this thing happened. Here's someone who knows something about this. What do you think about this? And then, so it's, it's, and not everybody's going to come every time and not everybody's going to be involved but there's sort of a critical mass of engagement. Really interesting. And I think this is quite uh, an educational uh, point. A massive, massive community I profile in the book is Sephora. Even though this company, which sells skincare and cosmetics, they've got brick and mortar stores. 80% of their revenue comes from their community. Here is their number one metric. It's not money. It's engagement. Mm -hmm. Are people active? Are they talking? Are they responding to the things we're putting out there? Because that's a leading indicator that they love what's going on, that their ideas and their new products and their new processes are heading in the right direction if people are engaging with this stuff and talking about it. So in the social media world, engagement is sort of seen as a fluffy metric sort of a vanity metric. Mm -hmm. um, but that's probably the most important metric in a community. Right. Yeah. Because engagement goes up, money follows, right? That's that's yes. downstream from... Yeah. So so we've got a, a saying that brain share is greater than wallet share. So if you ask people for their opinion, if you ask them to co-create, if you ask them for advice, feedback, they feel like they start to be invested in your project or your program or whatever. They feel like they've got a bit of a sense of ownership. And typically the money follows after that. They will be and happy. Let, and let me build on something there because what you're saying here is so important. I don't want to just throw this out as, you know, an offhand comment that you're making. This idea of being seen and rewarded and acknowledged is the most important thing you can do as a leader of the community. You're dispensing status. Hmm. And if people feel like they have status in the community, like they're being seen and heard and acknowledged, that's, that's really the engine for involvement in the community. And there's so many great case studies in the book, but the, the one that, that's so profound, it, it's so visionary, really. This is my 10th book, Mike. And this is the first time I ever devoted one chapter to, to one person. <laughs> and it's about a credible leader, Dana Maustaff, who has built this incredible community of 70,000 people. And she has no staff. It's completely run by volunteers. She looks for those emerging leaders and nurtures them and rewards them. And they believe in what she's doing so profoundly that they step up and take, you know, take control of these areas. So it was a very, such a keen point you were making there. I just wanted to emphasize that that's a, that's a, a crucial part of leadership in a community. Yeah. The last thing I want to ask you is you actually say that marketing can heal. And I know that you don't mean that in a sort of, ooh, sort of, Fuzzy right, way, but right. you, be, you you believe that it actually can. So my last question for you is: Can you paint us a picture of of if this works? If people mm -hmm. start doing this, if people start investing in community, if we help people be less lonely, if we help them increase their sense of emotional well being, yeah. if we are able to provide belonging, what does the world look like in in your eyes? Yeah. Well, I think the reason. I featured Dana in an entire chapter of the book. You know, I, I met her in 2018, I think. And when she was telling me what she was doing, 
I thought, I am looking into the face of the future of marketing mm. because in her first nine months of having her community, she had a six-figure income. She's had her community since 2016. It's basically doubled in size and in revenue each year. So when I say revenue in the nonprofit world, think fundraising. All right. She's now approaching a million dollars in revenue. She has no sales department. She has no marketing. She has no marketing budget. Because when you're part of this community and you share this purpose and you share this belief and you believe in what Dana is doing, so much. Dana doesn't sell. Dana doesn't push. She doesn't market. She creates a safe place that validates people, rewards people, nurtures people. One of the amazing things is when people sign up for a community, she she said, well, let me know, you know, when's your birthday? And what's a special day where something happened in your life that always makes you sad when you hit that day. You don't have to tell me what it is. And when when people hit that anniversary, she sends them a little video saying, I know this isn't your best day, but I just want to tell you that you're loved and, and, and you know you belong here and we appreciate you. And I hope you get through this day okay. All right? Now, don't get me wrong. This is a business. But people be- belong there so profoundly and so strongly. She never has to sell. She never has to market. Wouldn't it be magnificent to be in a world where you never have to, you know, have a fundraising campaign again, where you never have to worry about how much money you're spending on Facebook ads. You don't need it. You don't need SEO. You don't need Facebook ads. You don't need branded content. You don't need any of that. Need any of that. It's po- it's more than possible. It's happening. It's already there. You know, in the, the case study that we talked about with Alice, she she points to donors in this community. Instead of giving a hundred dollars a year, we're giving a hundred dollars a month because of their you know commitment to because now you're people, it's relationships mm-hmm. instead of just you know, oh, well, it's time to, you know, write a check for something that's, you know, I think they're doing good work. So, I mean, this this isn't fut- the future. This is happening now. It's accessible now. It, it just, it's just completely off the radar screen of, of most organizations. I mean, one of the things I say, I go to a lot of marketing conferences. You probably go to a lot of nonprofit conferences. In terms, for me, I've never been to a marketing conference where there's been a track or even a speech on community. It's like, what, you know, what the heck is going on? Mm-hmm. This should be a dominant topic for me, for my world and for your world. Well, Mark, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. Uh, if people want to know more about you, if, if people are, uh, are bought in to what you've been saying, and, and I hope they are, where can they find you? Where, where can they get belonging to the brand, the book? And what are, what are some next steps that they can take? Yeah. Well, probably people won't remember how to spell Schaefer. But don't worry about that, friends. <laughs> if you can remember, businesses grow. And by businesses, I mean nonprofits too. <laughs> Businessesgrow.com. You can find my blog, my podcast, my events, all my books. Belonging to the brand is there. All my other books are there. And you can find Amazon on in paper, ebook, hardback, and an audio version narrated by me on Amazon. And what if people want to join your community? What how do they do that? It's free. It's open on um my website, businesses grow. There's a tab that says community and it just says, send me a note and I'll get you in. Well, thanks, Mark. Very much appreciate this. All right. Thank you, Michael.